Hello everyone, today I'm gonna be doing a overview of my own home server that I bought on eBay for around 70 euros. I bought this Elitesk 800 Generation 1 small form factor with an Intel Core i5 4590 with 4 cores, 4 threads, a base clock of 3.3 GHz and a boost clock of 3.7 GHz with an 84 Watt TDP. It also has Intel HD 4600 graphics with 2 GB of VRAM. The seller on eBay included 16 GB of DDR3 RAM and a 240 GB SSD. To connect it to my network I use the 1 Gigabit Ethernet port on the back and the whole thing runs of a 240 Watt 80 plus gold power supply. For the operating system I use Ubuntu Server 24.4. 4.2, the LTS version, and it comes with the Linux 6.8 kernel. And on top of Ubuntu server, I also run Casa OS. Oh no, it's a new gen tech toolkit. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. It's not that I'm not capable of running my own Docker services. In fact, in the beginning, I really just used a plain Ubuntu server on my laptop and had one Docker Compose file that contained all of my services. But as I was experimenting and experimenting, I really started to like the idea of an app store to download services that I maybe wanted to try, um, but was too lazy to configure. And with Casa OS, it's just really easy to look up a service, click install, and you don't have to do anything. You can just click on the shortcut and it opens and it works most of the times. But you still have the freedom to spin up your own Docker services and import them to Casa OS or just configure them in Casa OS uh, itself. So it's really easy and I personally love the Casa OS design. I love the icons, I love the frosted glass effect and it just really feels like the center of my, yeah personal home server. Next up we're gonna talk about the services that I host. On port 81 I host my own documentation service using Hugo. I write my docs in Markdown and Hugo converts them to an HTML page using the same custom theme that I created for my company site. I made it really easy to print out my own documentation if I need to and it automatically hides the header and uh, makes the background white and things like that. And it also includes a QR code to the online version because maybe I changed something and I look at the paper documentation and then I can just scan the QR code and go to the online version. This way I also create my contracts and I made it also really easy to just click sign and then I use DocuSeal to send the contracts to uh, the clients that need to sign them. DocuSeal is the next service that I host on my service and it's an open source online signing service that has a free plan where you can do almost everything. For me it's just enough. Or you can buy the pro plan for $20 per user per month uh, and then you can add a custom logo or send HTML emails or uh, there is a watermark in the bottom on the free version uh, on the emails. So uh, you also don't get that on the paid version, but except that the free version is more than enough for most people, I think. You just create templates from a PDF or HTML file, and then you can email a sign invitation to your clients. You do need to provide your own SMTP server so you can host it yourself, but I just use the Gmail one because I can send 2000 emails a day, which is more than enough for me. <laughs> I wish I had that much clients. Obviously for the web server you need to open up a port otherwise your client can't access the web server. But more on security later in this video. To access my documentation from outside I use Twingate. For security I closed off my documentation entirely. It's only accessible from my own network because Obviously, I don't want the whole world to uh, see my documentation, but when I need to access it outside, I use Twingate. It's an easy way to access services from the outside world. It's really easy to set up and you have much control over who can access what. They have a paid plan, but also a free plan, which is uh, more than enough for most people. So if you have services that you expose to the internet, but only you use, uh, I would recommend just to use Twingate because it is much more secure. Next up, I run SyncThing to synchronize my uh, Obsidian Vault to all my devices. It runs on my server, on my PC, my laptop and my phone and it constantly synchronizes uh, all my folders and files in my Obsidian Vault. It has a really nice web GUI and it's really easy to set up and configure. Next up, I run Nginx with Certbots. I don't run it in a Docker container because I just found it easier. Uh, it was the way I did it 
way back on my laptop. On Nginx I host my own download service which is really just a simple web server. I have a simple client python script that uploads the files to a shared folder to the server and also generates a metadata.json file that includes just the file name, the title, expiration date and file size. And when the user loads the page, it just fetches the data uh, from the file. So no complicated databases. I also have a server Python script that checks if files are expired and deletes them. For my download service, I also host an API, which is really just an Express.js uh, API running in Node.js. It sends me an email when people download the files it also lets me list all the files on the server and I can also view the access logs. Obviously, I secured most parts of the API with an API key. Last up, I use Plex uh, to watch movies, TV shows and my own um, film projects because I'm also a filmmaker, uh, so I can watch my own projects in high quality. I think you all know what Plex is. Next up, security. Obviously, I only expose ports that I really need to. I expose port 80 for HTTP traffic and 443 for HTTPS traffic. That's all, no other ports. As I said, I use Twingate for all the services that only I need to access. So SSH, my documentation service, Plex, all via Twingate. My web services I route through Cloudflare, so they're protected for DDoS attacks. But currently I only proxy my DocuSeal service, because my download service needs a higher bandwidth than the uh, free version of Cloudflare allows. So I only use it for DNS. This means that my public IP technically is exposed if people ping uh, my download service. But for me it doesn't really matter, because I don't host anything malicious on there. And I don't really care, because there are many other ways you can find someone's public IP and you can't really do anything with it realistically. To log into my SSH server, I use SSH keys. I can just connect with a password. It's not allowed. It only allows SSH keys that are added to the server manually. So for my PC, my laptop and my phone, I have separate SSH keys that I added manually to the server. So only my PC, my laptop and my phone are allowed to connect with SSH. And last but not least, I use fail to ban in combination with IP tables. fail to ban scans the logs of my uh, SSH server and web servers and uses filters to block malicious activity. It adds malicious IPs to an IP tables uh, block list for 30 minutes and also reports them using the abuse IP database API. The abuse IP database is a really nice website where you can look up an IP and see uh, if they're malicious, if they have been reported before. And most people also include logs, so you can see what pages they try to access. And it's a free service, so it's just really a no-brainer to uh, integrate to your server. They also provide a blacklist. With the free plan, you get access to 10,000 IPs. And those IPs are 100% malicious people. If you're on that list, man, you really fucked up. <laughs> So every night I just fetch the blacklist from the abuse IP database and they don't even get a chance to connect to the server. They're just blocked from the beginning. Don't even get a chance to probe any of my pages. But as I said, people on those lists are 100% malicious. So the chance that you're gonna block regular visitors is really, really small. I call my server CS30 and people that watch Mr. Robot can maybe already guessed that the name is inspired by the server that was hacked in one of the first seasons of Mr. Robot. And I also set the IP address of the server to 192.168.0.30 as a little easter egg. And it also falls outside the DHCP range that my internet provider uses. So there you go, that's my own home server. I know it's really not that impressive, but for the things I use it for, it's really more than enough. And I really enjoy tinkering around with it. If if you guys want to know anything more specific about uh, one of the services I used, you can leave a comment down below and maybe I'll make a video about it. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in another one. Bye bye.